welcome again to Roots and Roots, uh, this joint seminar between UHI Archaeology Institute and the Orkney Archaeology Society. Um, and my name is Ragnil Yuslan. I'm introducing both because I am wearing two hats, <laughs> both the Archaeology Institute hat and the uh, on behalf of the OAS committee. I would very much like to welcome Professors Jane Downs and Colin Richards, um, both from the UHI Archaeology Institute. Jane leads the Institute and those two have been working together for many, many years, far longer than I have known them. Um, and also have been coming out to Polynesia for many years. Um, and you might think that it's a novel idea to do a talk about Polynesia for the Orkney Archaeology Society and Yushai Archaeology Institute. But it's not really because when you start looking into it in detail, there are many parallels and so many learning points that we can learn about Orkney archaeology from studying Polynesian archaeology. So I'll not go on any longer. I'll hand over to you, Jane. Thank you, Raggy, and thanks for the invite to give this lecture. I realised it doesn't move my head like this. I've got a halo on. Yes, I could I could wear that for the for the talk. Anyway, um, <laughs> welcome everybody. And yes, we're going to be talking about our work in Polynesia, specifically Rapa Nui and the Cook Islands. Um, I have moved to my presentation. There we go. So yes, this is um, a project that Colin and I are going to be speaking to you about, but um, listed here are the colleagues that we're working with on the project. So Lawrence is here, hello, and there's Kate, Hanjo, and Matt in uh, far-flung places. Um, so we work together as a team on the on the work we're doing in the Cook Islands, um, and we being given funding by various bodies and various support, particularly from Global Challenges funding until it ended. Um, of course, it's also work that we've been undertaking with the community on Rarotonga and the other Cook Islands, and we wouldn't be able to conduct the work without their friendship and their support. Um, so tonight we'll be looking at the, the big questions, um, Colin will be kicking off looking at um, the Polynesian colonization of the Pacific and Rarotonga's place in that, uh, thinking about roots um, and roots as in as in people and, and the way they move, to, move around in Eastern Polynesia. And then we'll be looking more specifically at the questions we've been addressing in our research in Rarotonga and Rapa Nui as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Colin now. Uh, evening, everybody, and thank you, Jane. Um, I should add, Jane's been fiddling with this presentation, so anything could uh, come up, so I'll try and be nimble. But the truth is that um, Polynesian archaeology is so interesting. Any one of the things that we're going to talk about, the sort of themes, hopefully will be merging towards the end. Could be could be a lecture in themselves, so I'll try not to to ramble on too long. I want to start with uh, what's called the Polynesian problem, or what was called the Polynesian problem, and that was um, uh, a problem which was recognised back in the, the uh, late nineteenth, early twentieth century. And if you, for those of you who who know about the term, more of the sort of history of archaeology and so on you'll know that this is being done in the what under the rubric of what we would call culture histories and within that frame of reference what people are trying to do is they're trying to identify um clearly defined bounded cultures and they're trying to trace their roots of movement so 
the Polynesian problem is basically where where do the Polynesians come from? And um, the way in which this was um, partly investigated, okay, Jane, next slide, please, was in uh, New Zealand with uh, someone called Percy Smith. He was the fact he's actually the founder of the Polynesian Society that publishes a journal every every year. And what he as a so the way he in which he engaged with this problem was uh, through what was what we we would recognise as ethnology. It's it's like a, early spoke anthropology, archaeology. And so he interviewed any number of of, of Maori elders, and um, to talk about talk about their past, their history, and uh, and and to basically to to try and define their culture, and also through looking at their history and so on, where they came from. And it, it was some, he had some interesting results from that because the thing about um, the, the Maori culture at this time, there's there's a lot of other stuff going, a lot of political stuff going on. So we have these land, so-called land courts, where basically people are being, the indigenous population are being asked to prove that they actually live on and and um, belong in certain areas. So that aside for the time being, one of the things which um, came through in this is the is the way in which they answered those questions was through genealogy, and so they would recite their genealogy back. And and ultimately, that would come back to a particular place, um, a particular canoe that that tribe landed in, and that was often the name of the tribe itself, and also where they derived, and the place that they kept referring to as an origin or a homeland was a place called Hawaii. But the other thing which is which is really fascinating about this. Which, cause, which ultimately causes problems and manipulation of this information, is that um, Smith wants to write down history. He wants to, to find out about history, but the Maori elders are basically talking about myths. So there's a, there's a disjunction there between the sort of mythical structure which is being recited and the way it's being translated by Smith as a form of history. Okay, Jane, next slide, please. So, because there's a degree of um, ambiguity and difference about what they're saying, Smith actually irons this out, and and he comes up with this notion that this Hawaii, this place of origin across the ocean, um, it was recognised that it's it's a common, it's these sort of origin myths are common throughout Polynesia, and um, it's some Hawaii is somewhere in the west, because not only is it an origin place where people come from, it's where the dead go when they die. And in most of the islands, Polynesian islands, there's actually jumping off places on the west coast of the islands um, after people walk along a spirit road and they can jump into the ocean. And that's a conduit back to a Vayaki. So there was a bit of confusion. Um, the, the, oh, what's happened there? Um, there was a bit of confusion because in some accounts, Hawaii wasn't um, in the West. It was talked about as being in the East, but that was something that Smith suppressed because the, the majority of people recognized the homeland as, as being in the West. So subsequently, oh, Jane, can you go back to, yeah. Um, subsequently, archeologists did what archeologists do. They want to act, so, Hawaii is quite clearly a mythic, a mythical place to some degree, the way in which it's talked about. But archaeologists want to find out where that is, and so you have all these different. These are just three examples, and as you see, it, this is still going on. And um, most recently, Hawaii is being identified as the Southern Cooks, which is where we're working in Rarotonga. But the Australs, which is just a little bit um, the east of that, and then the Society Islands, which is above that. So. What we do, what we do know, is that the, the Polynesians seem to, uh, or the expansion across the East East Pacific is coming out of Samoa and Tonga. The question is when this is happening, 
and how and how and why it's happening and that too is a story in itself okay jane right so so yeah so this is basically what i've been saying so we can skip that one so so the, these these myths and the, these are some of the names of the canoes um they they created uh basically people stepping ashore there was a founder and this was a founding sort of um group and it also formed the basis of, of, of social identity and group affiliation where the canoes landed there was often a transmutation occurred so elements of the canoes would turn to stone and be recognizable as landscape features so this, so you have this sort of um attachment of people uh, to the to the, the people before them to a genealogy to the canoes which brought them there and the physical uh, uh, reminders of, of the landing place after they've landed from this mythical place of Aki. Okay, Jane. Yes, so the, so this is the first interesting thing. And again, it's not something we can we can really talk about too much here, but the actual canoes feature in the genealogies themselves. So here we have an instance. This is starting to give us an indication that the animate world and the inanimate world actually do blur and mingle. There's far more ambiguity about um, the status of things in, in Polynesia, but we can't talk anymore. Okay, Jeannie. And of course, because the, because the people were reciting or were talking about myth, and um, because Percy Smith was recounting this as history, Everything was fine when they were talking about uh, particular canoes and, and, and the landing places. But then there were other, other stories which were completely suppressed where um, they talked about their ancestors riding on the backs of whales from uh, Aveaki to Ata'aroa, which is the Maori name for New Zealand. And if you have, any of you have an opportunity, the class which I taught last semester will all have seen this, but if you have any um, time, I'd really urge you to see a film called Whale Rider, because this that sort of mythical structure is interweaved into a fabulous film. Okay, Janie. So if you can see the triangle there, um, this is the Poly so-called Polynesian Triangle, and it's formed through Atora in the south, New Zealand, you got Hawaii in the north and Rapa Nui in the east, and it's a vast area. We're looking at half the world there. The distances between between these islands are quite extraordinary, and the, the colonization process seems to occur over a very short period. Um, you see that it was thought to be between 900 and 1200, but I think there's increasing evidence. That actually, not only is it more compressed, it's actually slightly later. And this will have um, a little bit of uh, an impact on, on the dates that Jane tells you about later on for Rarotonga. Okay, Jane. Now the way the way in which um, or the reason also that uh, that New Zealand or Atara is in, important is that it's from Rarotonga that the, the supposed colonization process occurs. And, and of course, if you, if you think of, um, I think you can just about make it out here, Samoa and Tonga, this spread in an easterly direction. Um, the whole process and thing about voyaging itself is really interesting, and I could talk for ages about that. But the important point is that um, supposedly around 12, 50, you you would this is the sort of time when the first first people, the Polynesians step ashore in New Zealand, and the and coming from supposedly from Rarotonga. Okay, Jane. But more recently, and this has been this has been happening right the way across Polynesia over the last ten years or so, and that's a lot of the radiocarbon dates are being reevaluated, and uh, and and in some cases Bayesian statistics apply. 
And what's coming through is a much a sort of more sophisticated understanding of this process, because obviously um, trying to work out when someone was first settled is quite problematic. Um, but it does it does seem to be that um, a sort of reevaluation of what's going on in New Zealand is showing that um, actually the, the, the large wave of population coming or people coming in into both particularly the North Island, but also the South Island, is happening in the 14th century, in the 1300s. So, you know, it's being shift, this, is, this wave is being shifted forward a little bit. Okay, Jane. And I just, and again, I don't want to talk too much about voyaging, but we don't actually know what the voyaging canoes are really like. Um, there's been replicas designed and the most famous is Hokulea, which was uh, was built in Hawaii a number of years ago, and it sailed all around the Pacific. And it's actually interesting enough; it's been a catalyst and a for and um, a sort of uh, focal point of a more pan the evolution of a more pan Pacific identity or Polynesian identity. Because remember that um, the Pacific and particularly Polynesian was completely carved up amongst as different uh, colonies. So Hawaii, America, Rapa Nui, Chile, uh, Tahiti, France, Rarotonga, Cook Islands, Britain, and New Zealand. And, and in the main, these still remain. <laughs> Chile still owns Rapa Nui. Uh, Hawaii is one of those, Amer is an American state. Uh, uh, Tahiti and French Polynesia, is actually a French department. So colonial colonialism isn't actually dead in the Pacific, it's still there. And the, the sort of reinvention, if you like, of Polynesian voyaging has, has actually come and created links between those. The point is no one really knows what a voyaging canoe is like. None have been found until they, if parts of one were found um, off the Northwest Coast of the South Island in, in, uh, in New Zealand. And this is just by just just part. This is really interesting because the actual voyaging canoe is formed by P sections being stitched together, and which means that they can build really large craft. And these are thought to be double hull canoes. And um, there's actually carvings on this, turtle carvings. Well, the the wood is indigenous to to New Zealand, but the carving, the turtle, isn't. This is not the, the turtle isn't a well-known motif in Maori symbolism. Um, it is in more and further into East Polynesia. So we see something really interesting here occurring. And where this voyaging canoe has been, um, and it obviously ends its day here, is would be a really fascinating story. But this, I just thought people would be interested in that. Thank you, Jamie. So these these late dates and the fact that um, uh, New Zealand is, is apparently or arguably colonised from the Cook Islands in particular um, does have implications for the way in which we understand the, the first settlers and so on in the Cook Islands and particularly in Rarotonga. Okay, Jane. So when was Rarotonga settled? Um, up until recently, okay, next next slide, Jane. It was um, it was would have been people said, oh well, between say nine hundred and twelve hundred A.D. That would that was the main period of settlement. But again, through looking again at a, a reappraisal of the radiocarbon dates and and uh, the, the the radiocarbon dates from excavations in other islands in the South Coast. And this is a quote from Alan, Alan and Wallace. And they say, well, basically, whilst you, the, you can still say the light, likely period of the settlement is between 1000 and 1200, it's much more tenuous than we pre, was previously thought. Again, provide, if you think about that in relation to the potentially the later dates from New Zealand, it suggests perhaps that also Rarotonga and the South Cook Islands are be, potentially being settled that much later than we than we thought. 
the kitchen. And on Rarotonga, which is, as you'll see later, is the focus of our, our research, is not only one of the most famous roads, or the most famous road in Polynesia, it's also the largest, if you think of it as an as a architectural entity, it's the largest monument in all of Polynesia. And why is that significant? Can you have the next slide, please? <laughs> I'll have to answer that in a minute. Um, I just want just to think about circuit roads. Circuit roads aren't just known in uh, Rarotonga. They're also present in other islands. And this, the, um, the Phoenix Islands, for instance. Okay, Jane. This is, um, I don't know if you can just about see where the Phoenix Islands are. They're basically southwest, long, long, long way southwest of Hawaii, situated in that sort of central, central East Polynesia, I guess. So there's, um, an, there's an example of, of, a, of a circuit road in, in the Phoenix Islands. Okay, Jane. And, but they're also known on other, in other places and particularly in Hawaii and um, the circuit roads around a number of the islands, not least the big island. Okay, next slide, please. Now, in the word for road in Polynesia is ara, but in uh, across Polynesia, letters and, and, and things change. So in Hawaii, R's are pronounced Al, or R's changed to Al. So the Alaloa would be called the Ara Loa elsewhere. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing in itself, but it rings, the, um, there's an Alaloa which rings the big island, which is the, the map, those are the pictures you see there, but also some of the other islands as traces also of these circuit roads. Okay, Jane. So what, why is why is this of, of interest? Well, <clears throat> in in Hawaii we have got oral accounts of how certainly at the time of contact how these circuit roads were used, and so and let's let's take the one on the on the Big Island. It featured in in a thing called the Makahiki ceremony, and and it involved. Well, it took place on an annual basis, and it involved a clockwise movement around the island, carrying the god Lono. And the idea behind that is that every year the god Lono would visit the island, and um, he'd be he'd be taken round, and that whole circuit of the island would initiate a reproduction of society and, and a process of regeneration. I don't, I'm not talk about wrapping now, but it's quite interesting because wrapping is such a big and important idea in Polynesia. So we actually know from from the sort of oral accounts that um, these circuit roads did have a ceremonial and ritual function. And as it turns out, this is an, this is very interesting as an aside as well, because the demise of Captain Cook is linked into this ceremony because it just so happens that Cook arrives. Um, at the beginning of the Makahiki period and ceremony. And he's welcomed ashore as the god Lono, and he's treated like a god and, um, and joins in the, the ceremonies and the celebrations. Now, it just so happens that in the, in the ritual, the ceremony, the god Lono disappears, then comes back and is ritually slaughtered. And that brings the end of that, that's the end of the ceremony. And it just so happens that um, whilst Cook was heading north, his mast broke on it, and he returned to Hawaii. And they come ashore, and of course, Cook is murdered. And so, if you and this is something that Marshall Silence has written about. So, if you if you think about um, the, the coincidence, unfortunate coincidence for Cook, of his landing and him being mistaken for the god Lono, his 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 death isn't some sort of barbaric um, occurrence. It's perfectly consistent with beliefs in Hawaii at that time. Okay, Jane, let's... next one, please. And um, 
So this is where I'm not sure what I would change, change it. But anyway, if we go on to Rapa Nui, which you see here, which is on Easter Island, there is also, there's this Aramahiva, which isn't such um, a prominent road, but it does. it is a, a yet another circuit road. So where we have, where there's good evidence and where, where um, archaeological investigations have taken place, it does seem that this notion of a circuit road, which wraps around the island, is quite common to a number of the Polynesian islands. Okay, Jane. And I, I can't show you, but maybe, can you see it coming diagonally into the centre where the horses are? Can you see a sort of line of cleared stones? That's remnants of it. It's very, very few places where it survives. This is in the northwest of the island, which where people really don't go. It's I think it's probably protected natural park actually. Okay, Jane. <clears throat> and of course, what? Uh, so it may be that that section that you see up at the top, left, so the top of the island. These are these are roads. These are probably so-called Moai roads. But the, I think that top section may be part of one of these, these ring roads. Anyway, the reason that um, the, that Rapa Nui is also famous for its roads is, is are these the Ara Moai, the, the famous Moai roads, which still you can still see and you can still walk along. And they, as you can see, they radiate away from the from Rana Uraraku, which is the quarry where the the famous Moai, the statues are made. Okay, no, I don't know what's next. So the, the, the volcano in the background, that is Rana Uraraku, and here's a section of the road, and you see it's still got curbing along it. And again, the reason that this is all preserved or still there is because the Chilean Navy or Chilean government turfed the Rapa Nui people off their, off their land in the 1890s and pushed them all and put them in um, one settlement on the west coast called Hangaroa and fenced them in and and then gave the whole of the rest of the island over to Sheep Ranch. And guess who ran the Sheep Ranch? Some, a firm called Williamson and Balfour. And the, the fact is, it's almost like the Scottish clearances taking place here on Rapa Nui, on the other side of the road, administered by a Scottish firm um, some hundred years later than it takes place in Scotland. Okay, Jane. And this is the, the spectacular Rano Raraku. It must be one of the, I'm sure Jane would agree, it must be one of the most amazing things you could ever see because not only is the volcanic uh, cone basically carved from where there's all the quarrying's taken place, but the whole thing is is ringed to some extent by standing moai, and you can just see them perhaps standing up, speckled at the bottom of the of the steep slopes, which you see. Also, can you make maybe make out the oh, where the quarries are? Okay, Jim. Now, the moai roads are really interesting because what you find there. Is the so-called statues fallen by the, or lying? The so-called in transit statues by the roadside, and these were always these were talked about as if they were just abandoned en route. Well, through some of the research that we've done and another group has done, it's quite obvious that they were standing. So, to get so, and they're all looking away from the quarry. Now, these these Moai roads have been talked about all the time about how they were used to transport the statues away from the quarry. So, in various papers and so on, we've argued that the important thing is not moving away from the quarry, it's that actually approaching the quarry. And all these statues, when standing, would be facing you as you approach the, the quarry. And as you get closer, they get more frequent until you get there, and then you have to go through that barrier. This is all to do with the sacredness and what's called tapu, and, and how when you enter anywhere sacred, you have to go through graded space. And these standing moai perform that function. Okay, Jane. Right, was, we're returning to to um, to the Aram Mature on the Cook Islands, and I don't know if you want to take over here. I'm not sure what the next slide is, and but um, because if if you think of what I've just said about the um, 
Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So here's, here's a series of questions. If you think about what I said about the Alaloa and how that was employed, this anti, this clockwise, sorry, this clockwise movement of um, taking the god Lono around as a as an annual ceremony of regeneration, we suddenly start to can ask questions, similar questions about what's going on in Rarotonga, except that we have all traditions there. And how, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's following on, but I just, so I just blurt this out. And um, it's been talked about, the Aram of Mature has been talked about as a materialization of the route that the founder took as he moved around the island, establishing Marai, which is basically temples, and dividing the land up into segments. And so, the the and in that case, he's going and apparently, as far as we know, he's going anti-clockwise. So that's so putting those two things together um, leads to a whole series of, of questions. So was the Aram mature for ritual stuff? How does it relate to the temple or to the Marai system? Because if if we follow on from from the oral histories. It should relate to the earlier circuit. So it should relate very early in Rarotongan Polynesian prehistory. What was it constructed on? There's lots of conflicting accounts, each of which makes it a miraculous thing. Either it's paved with white coral with black basalt curbs or else the reverse. So was that consistent construction all the way around or was it a bit like we find with the Ara Moai in Rapa Nui, where when the road passes um, particular places, Ahu, which is the equivalent of Marai, their temples with the statues on them, as it passes those, it becomes embellished and far more substantial. And then when it leaves the, these places, it changes back to maybe just a sort of almost depression. And also when it runs into different group areas, it may well choose. So it's kind of like a potential um, resource that people can employ to not only demonstrate their own identity, but also to, to formalize and display particular important places by virtue of aggrandizement of the road. So can we, can we investigate that? And I think I'm going to hand over to Jane now for the, for the rest. I'm not sure if I can be heard. Yes, you can be heard, Jane. I can. Oh, that's good. I was a bit worried because I had my mute open and the dog was carrying on. Anyway, so um, this is what Bach wrote about the road, and this relates to what Colin was saying about it appearing, um, being described um, in terms of what it, how it's built and um, what it looks like. Um, and so in starting our investigations, we hung our investigations on the road, the circuit road that runs around the island of Rarotonga, um, which sits underneath the modern road largely. So it was with the description, this particular description in mind that we were, we were looking for this uh, following um, Matt Campbell's work where he'd um, been looking for the remains and um, re-looking for the remains of the road that could be found and then um, using geophysical survey to check um, for, for stretches of the road. And so it was, we were very much influenced by this, this paragraph and this description. Um, but we did find, as, as you'll see, that it was quite different in different places, as Collins mentioned. So this is, um, um, we've spoken about this to some extent before. So here we're going to have some update on the work that we've been doing, but we'll have some other background as well. So these were um, the objectives of the last work we were able to do, which of course we haven't been able to do for the, the last um, couple of years, we haven't been able to revisit, but it has given us an opportunity to do some post excavation. So we'll just be talking about the results of that too. Um, so to provide um, up to date information of the survival of the monuments. So these are the monuments that are attached to the road and that the road um, was presumably um, that were, well, perhaps created at the same time as the road or, and 
are linked by the road. So this is the Marai um, or temple. So these are um, they correspond to the to the Ahu in in Rapa Nui um, and other similar structures elsewhere in Polynesia. Um, these are temple complexes um, which do actually sit to either side of the road uh, to excavate a section of the road um, and to record this. Um, magnificent Marae complex, which is Zorai to Tonga, um, and to look at how um, you know the the road could be better displayed and better understood generally. Uh, so this is the survey of um, the circuit road. It's the inner road that runs around um, the island of Rarotonga. So the, the high parts are in the middle, um, and you come down to the the flatter coastal areas and the the original road ran round um, where all these sites are marked and the outer road beyond that is the more modern road. So the, um, the settlement when the when the island was. Um, um, when uh, Western when Europeans arrived and the people were converted to Christianity, they moved people um, onto the coast, onto the coast road um, and um, destroyed as many of the sites. Uh, associated with the older religion, the original religion as they could. Um, so that's why it's so hard to um, de define or determine these sites because they've been um, willfully destroyed and then there's been a lot of development since and um, houses and roads built. So that shows the distribution of the existing sites and these are things like um, the remains of Marai, um, the, some of the curbing of the road and um, some upright stones that um, are related to various kinds of features um, and upright backs of chairs where people um, would have sat for certain ceremonies. Um, undertaking geophysical survey, here's Kate marching. This is at um, Araita Tonga where we homed in on this particular stretch, which is the, the best preserved and really the only reasonable stretch of the ancient road that survives because the modern road which sits to the uh, right hand side of this picture was moved in order that this um, piece of road could be preserved because it sits in front of this most important marae which is the right Tonga itself a Karutu um, which of all the marae in in the Cooks is particularly central and sacred um, and has another whole complex around it, but this is the main the main um, building of it here. And you can see behind Kate's um, back leg, <laughs> um, there's a, a stretch of curbing and upright stones. And these are one side of the road and the front of the marae. And the other side under the trees, there are little stumpy stones. And these are some of the chair backs uh, where people would sit facing the marae on the other side of it. And here the geophysical results are showing the different types of stone uh, making up the sides of the road. So you've got basalt um, showing up in, in those plots. So just to focus a, a little bit for a minute on Marae, um, as I say, they have correspondence um, widely through Polynesia. Um, and so, and you know, a lot of people focus on um, Rapa Nui and say how it's extraordinary and well, it is. Um, the, the Ahu, but they are a, a form of Marae. And um, the Marae in um, the Cook Islands had wooden statues on, by and large, um, and these were largely burnt um, and, of course, didn't survive as well if they weren't burnt either. Um, so very few of those survived, but they were quite huge. Um, so, yeah, they're known variously as Ahu Marae. Um, and they have upright stones, um, as you can see on this diagram, and that's what we were seeing in um, some of those photographs. And then um, in the Marquesas, you get this fantastic complex, um, which is a World Heritage Site. It's the only World Heritage Site in that part of the world relating to uh, Polynesian people. Um, and um, yeah, in the Marquesas, we have um, statues like this. So a lot of variation in the type of um, statues that sit on Marae in different island groups. Um, and here, 
as I say, in the Cook Islands, they're wooden. And here, Colin's beloved wrapping, you'll see how this staff god is wrapped um, and would have been unwrapped on certain occasions. So they sit um, either, they sit in the, in the structures sometimes, there are houses built for them to live in and then they come out um, and are brought out for certain ceremonies. Uh, but as I say, not many of these um, survive, but they're quite, they're really, really quite impressive and quite amazing. So this is just uh, come back to Marae Tonga, um, the Marae, and you can see an upright stone on here, as um, we saw in some of those diagrams and some of the other edging stones. And this is actually particularly lined up to sit um, with this mountain framed in the background. Uh, this is this picture was taken after excessive amounts of tree and bush clearing that went on through our through our season, aided by the the prisoners um, from the, the Cook Islands um, prison. Um, so that was a lot of clearing, uh, and in addition to the clearing we did ourselves and with other volunteers. Uh, so th there we could see that stone again in the setting that it was made to be in, with the that particular peak in the background. Uh, so following the geophysical survey, uh, we were able to, we were really, really lucky and um, really pleased to be offered the opportunity to do an excavation across the surface of the road. Um, and this is the, the Marai, the front of the Marai, you can see the coral blocks um, and the, the chair backs. And um, then you can see the red arrows uh, show the the width of the road sitting in front of the Marai um, and that was the place that we located the section across the road. Coming onto the road surface um, you can see this um, cobbled, rammed cobbles of um, coral so these have been brought from the shore um, and put onto the surface and they're really quite compacted and rammed. So this was um, there hasn't been much excavation undertaken on Rarotonga, even though it's the biggest island. There's been more field work done on some of the smaller outer islands. Um, so we were really working fairly blind as to um, what period we were looking at in terms of this road surface, uh, as to how modern or how ancient it was. Um, and it was only as we were, we were sort of going down through the layers of the road surface, we were getting a better idea of the fact that this was this last surface was was not that old really and had been used in living memory um, before the, the modern road had been moved to the side and tarmacked um, as it's all mixed in and, and laying closely on top of earlier surfaces. So it's got the rammed coral and then at the sides um, in this um, earthen area to the left uh, there were actually basalt uh, cobbles set on end which have been largely removed um, through the years. So that's looking where we're half sectioning it and we're coming down onto in the section um, where the scale's lying we're going down further below the more modern um, upper surfaces and coming onto the um, earlier surfaces of the road so it's been remade and relayed through time um, and as you go down, you get um, just a smaller gravel particles of coral making up the surface um, in contrast to this larger cobbling of um, coral. And then, lo, we were blessed with a little piggy. Um, there are a lot of pigs on the Cook Islands. Um, they're gorgeous. They run around, particularly when we're digging at a right tonga because they're after the breadfruit as they fall off the trees. Um, Anyway, um, this one hadn't been so fortunate, and probably that one neither um, by now. But um, so this uh, skeleton that you see um, being excavated here, it's a bit difficult from this angle, but it's um, beneath the road surface. So up at the top of the slide, you can see the coral um, gravel of the road, the earlier road surface. And then you can see a certain depth of soil and then this um, pig skeleton. So we were able to excavate this, um, bring it back to the UK and um, have it identified and then um, get some C14 dates. And these are dates that we haven't published yet. So 
this is new information. Um, so that uh, pig skeleton, which, as you will recall, was lying below this surface here, produced um, a date of AD 1450. So this relates to what Colin was saying. In fact, we've got another date from the same skeleton as well, which is about the same, just a little bit, a little bit before that. So this is um, first part of the 15th century. So this is, um, as Colin was saying, these dates are looking you know, that the actual colonization or the, you know, the, the, the dates are being pushed a bit later. Generally, there's general acceptance of that. The issue with these um, dates that we've got from this pig is um, that we don't know what other surfaces of the road might lie below or you know how high up in the sequence um, the pig skeleton was. So we excavated further down to the bottom of these um, soil deposits. So the pig was um, up here above the level of that, that sample you can see in situ. We did columns throughout the whole profile um, which we'd recently had um, analysed um, by Reading University. And that reveals um, three phases of soil. So that's buried surfaces and subsoil horizons. So what we were ideally looking for were earlier road surfaces or compaction within the soil profiles to help us understand whether this um, coral gravel surface is some of the later surfacing um, and we, we have earlier pathways or roads underneath or not. This is really hot off the press, so we've still got to absorb and um, go back to look at the context and the, and the sections in more detail. But it seems as though uh, even though there aren't specific surfaces as such, um, there are three phases of soil below uh, surfaces below the, the pig. So we are looking at occupation indicated by the charcoal throughout the profile that relates to pre-1450. So this is really interesting. And as we see from the charred plant remains, which were done in, identified in New Zealand for us, um, there's really interestingly um, charcoal from candlenut and breadfruit species, uh, which are the, the, some of the things that were being introduced by, by the, by the colonizers. So that's um, all food for thought, which we've just we've just got through, and that was with a grant from the um, Society of Antiquaries, and Kate's been coordinating all that. So we return to that um, description of the Aramatua, the road, uh, which Buck or Hiroa first first gave us that paragraph we showed, and the photograph that he had accompanying that, and it shows these mighty blocks defining the edge of the road. And in fact, we excavated this very section. We re-excavated, um, well, very close to this, um, at the site at Ari Ararangi, which sits right next to Aratatonga and is part of the same Marai complex. So here we have the road beautifully exposed uh, with these big black basalt blocks um, and curbing. And this is the, the upright slabs at the top of the screen are the um, the sort of edging of the monument that joins onto the road at this point. So this is what's called a pie pie, which I'll show you in a second. So you can see the surfaces of the road is covered in sand, which is probably a bit more modern. Uh, but these blocks are very different to how we see it not not a hundred meters away at Araita Tonga. So this is this kind of variation which makes it very hard to define the road all the way round and indicates that they are embellishing. The road at particular points um, on its on its journey and for their journeys on the road. So the monument that attaches to the road, which you can see leads up from it and away in an L shape, should have been a T shape, but the the, the other branch of the T T has been um, removed by um, agricultural activity. And this was a labour of love by uh, Lawrence and Kate and many other people to remove all the tree cover from this. This Pai Pai um, is part of, I say, the Marai complex. So this is about a path leading off the road, which is this long um, pathway leading to the T shape, which would have been at the front of a building, a house structure, um, a, a big ceremonial house um, 
So these are set back from the road and are um, different kinds of structures to Marae themselves, but are all related. Um, and so this in its own right is really impressive. Um, you can see it's, again, there's this very specific use of these contrasting coloured stones with the coral and the basalt. And so that returns us back to what Colin was talking about in Hawaii um, and in Rapa Nui as well as this conscious use of different materials to uh, mark out different different parts of the path and different edges and boundaries. And there, Lawrence has done this brilliant diagram which shows you the basalt and the coral and the contrast. Um, and this um, kind of work helped us, well, as we were trying to find the, the road, the remains of the road, we were looking out for these different types of stone. And here we can see them at the, uh, the opposite side of the end of the island where we're doing our survey and trying to pick out which bits of the road the Aramatua survive. So um, that really brings us back to. Um, Let's back round to the end of our story, really. Um, we feel that we're some way towards um, establishing the nature of the road, even though we're only excavating one part. We're getting some glimpses into possible chronology, and um, we're looking at how parts of the road that do survive can be better protected by working with people who are working in management and um, and the, the community that, that, that lives there indeed. Um, so I'll I'll stop there now and, and Colin can leap in if I've if I've missed anything. Otherwise we'll take questions. Are you leaping Colin? We will we go to questions? Okay folks so if you have questions type them in the QA section now. I wanted to ask you both um, to come back to, to Orkney again and think about, I know you've been thinking about um, migrations and approaches and movements and this structuring of the landscape. And Colin, you've especially talked about wrapping, the idea of wrapping. So I was just wondering if you could draw some parallels or maybe say which new questions that this work in Polynesia has allowed you to ask about Orkney archaeology? Shall I answer that, Jane? Um, well, of course, Polynesia is the other side of the world. And uh, although we're dealing with uh, basically Polynesian prehistory, it's only, as you saw, it's only a matter of seven eight hundred years ago that we're really dealing with that <clears throat> so it's very very different but i must confess that uh the, well, it's, it's not so much the notion of wrapping um which i found quite interesting it's the notion of um a degree of fluidity of the want of a better word of materials and the, the reason that you get wrapping in polynesia is because there's always the danger that materials will flow and from one to the other and there's always a there's always problems of what they would call tapu which is a difficult concept but it's it's a cross between tapu and sacred and uh, protection keeping the integrity of materials keeping the because materials aren't neutral um so so basically what, what that kind of certainly allowed me to do was uh, and oh the other thing about why is that important because it allows you to relate lots of disparate things because as you saw they wrap the staff dogs they they wrap themselves in tattoos they um they employ all all sorts of different mechanisms in, in as to what we would call wrapping by different materials but it's all it's all to do with this insecurity and the desire to keep things apart and prevent contamination and flow between them. And I think that I find that quite interesting because, you know, is is that something unusual? For us, there's a degree of integrity to materials. They don't flow necessarily, um, they're, they're stable. But, you know, we're in a sort of um, in post-enlightenment world and 
I, I just wonder whether when you if you go back in time that that's a constant problem for people and I've certainly found in the Neolithic where you do get an obsession with polishing things creating skins bounding things from the architecture and so on I would I think you can at least start to think about things in those terms that what that's telling you is that at that time there is a concern about the integrity of things and that they may contaminate they may spread they may flow and they may transform so I think there's certain elements of working in Polynesia when I first started working I thought oh I'm not having any more to do with the British Neolithic it's far too boring Polynesia is wonderful and so on but actually I, I found there's a kind of reflexive um, sort of uh, relationship between what, what we're doing in Polynesia and thinking in some ways about um, British prehistory. Thank you. Well, we've got the question here from Dili coming. Owl and Poe, dark and light, coral and basalt, are these colours connected? Well, I read it again. So this is from Dili. She says, Owl and Poe, dark and light, coral and basalt, are these colours connected? Yes, I, I know what she's doing. Right, Ao and Po, these are, these are the two domains, okay? So Ao is the everyday domain of the living, the, the, the everyday world, and Po is the other world. It's, um, it's the realm of the dead, it's the realm of the deities, um, and it is, and there is that association with light and dark. Now, whether, whether that's transferred to the, to the actual materiality of robes, is another matter but um certainly colors and co obviously color symbolism and the re its relationship to the materials and where they come from because as it turns out coral does come from the sea and the sea is a conduit back to Hawaii. so you know i think the, the beauty about polynesia or polynesian archaeology is you have got the oral accounts you have got the missionary accounts you've got a degree of knowledge about their belief system, which you simply don't have, say, in British prehistory, which allows you to actually start to examine some of these ideas and come up with perhaps more sophisticated interpretations. Thank you. Now, here's a question from Bob Smith. Apart from the boat shown that dates to the 15th century, is there archaeological evidence for other boats? That's that. Um, yes and no. Um, when uh, Sonoto excavated in Hiahuni, which is one of the Society Islands, it was in advance of a hotel being developed, and, and hotels were being built in swamps, which uh, I'm not sure how that would have played out in terms of visitors later. But um, because it was swamp and wet, wetlands, he did find planks, which at the time were considered to be perhaps, they were so big, because these voyaging canoes, um, although there's none remaining, and again, sort of in the accounts, we're, we're thinking they're sort of like 50, 60, 70 metres, not big, big, big vessels to cross the Pacific Ocean. He also found a very long, this is Sonoto, he also found a very long, um, stretch of timber which was thought to perhaps be a mast from a voyaging canoe. Um, some of this material I think has become, people started to question its validity. But apart from that, we're completely in the dark. And, and, we, and when, when I was in Hawaii, I stayed with a lady who said that when the, the Hokalea, that's a double hulled replica of a voyaging canoe was built, there was a lot of um, argument and discussion about what the the voyaging canoe should be really like because no one knew um so it, it's one of those things where we we know that they were there we know they were very sophisticated craft because crossing the pacific literally hundreds and hundreds of miles re require with a lot of people and, and animals and cereals and so forth it requires substantial craft but they're no longer there so that that bit of a voyaging canoe which was found was a real find and of course, the fact that it's decorated is just brilliant. Wow, I can see it from my inner eye here now. Um, 
that was all the questions that had come in in the Q and A. Can I just, come in, Jane? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say that there are also the the, the so-called canoe ramps, aren't there, Colin? At uh, in um, Rapa Nui. Yeah, there's some um, indicator of the size, I guess. Yes, I mean, there's there's lots of um, information around the canoes and their building. In Hawaii, there's canoe roads, there's canoe temples where they were consecrated before they went to sea. There's even stories of them being launched over the, the dead bodies or the living bodies of, of slaves and so on. So there's, there's lots of accounts of things surrounding. It's just we haven't got any idea what they were really like as craft. So, so finding that section, I mean, I don't think it particularly, you know, it's not enough to say, okay, this is part of a doubled hull canoe, but I think it's going some way towards that. There's a new question comes in now from Dili. Were the voyages restricted to gender? Were the voyages restricted to gender? Yeah. I, I suppose she means were the voyagers predominantly of one gender? Well, because we don't know. I mean, we do know that there was enough of them that they could actually colonise them. So presumably, there's a mixture, of, a mixture of men and women and animals and, and stuff. But of course, again, it's really difficult to, to tell. On Rapa Nui, there was only supposed to be one group of black people landing, and that was based on on the language, on the, the, the you know the antiquity of Polynesian. Um, but you know. It, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised that certainly over this fairly short period, there was quite a lot of landings and and much more of a mixture than we perhaps think. This led me to wonder, were the voyaging canoes gendered? Are they spoken of as, as gendered? Sorry, was that the question whether the canoes were gendered? Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. that. You, you could perhaps get some insight into that if you looked at the names, say in in New Zealand, the, the names and whether they are gendered. Is that from Dealey? No, that was me just adding that thought. There's oh, okay. no more questions in the Q and A. Yeah, so I think I think you could tell that from the names, but I, I'm I'm not hundred percent sure. And certainly now that the navigators, the traditional navigators are, are male, aren't they, Colin? I don't know of any female ones spoken of. So the, the tradition of navigation was largely lost. Um, and the VACA, the Cook Islands VACA that we went out on, they'd re-imported that knowledge, was it, from Fiji? Yeah, it, it was... Um... So when they when they created when they built Hokulea, which was the experimental voyaging canoe, they got a navigator in from the, uh, Micronesia, where there's still there's still a handful of people who maintain that tradition, and they actually it's really excellent because they sit in stone canoes on the beach and learn, and um, and there's, there's, they also when they're at sea, it's a different form of reality, and. Um, they feel like they're stay, uh, stationary, and the and the the land, the skies, and the land comes towards them. It's quite it, the whole thing about voyaging is brilliant. Fascinating. Thank you both so much. Um, I can't see any more questions, so we'll end there with a big round of virtual applause from everybody. Um, and if anyone here would like to come back and hear more. The next uh, UHI Archaeology Institute seminar is on the 29th of April at 4 p.m. when we'll hear from Karen Holmquist about the runes in May's house. She's recently defended for her PhD a new study of the runes in May's house um, using practice theory and cognitive theory. So uh, studying the the um, carver's expressions of our social identity. So that's on the 29th of April. Thank you very, very much, Colin and Jane, for this wonderful talk. There's lots of people saying thank you in the chat as well.
Fleur says wonderful, thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks, Fraggy, for, for doing all the work. 